The Imperial Corps sits at the precipice of an irreconcilable internal contradiction between a supposed left and a supposed right, spiraling deeper into civil unrest and conflict, marred by market crashes, tariffs, trade wars, and driven by a foreclosure on the language needed to express this material objective. As a pseudo-left gentrifies the metropolitan financial hubs, they only masquerade in progressive pagantry, failing to capture the substance of the dying real economy within their borders and falling prey to politicians who bastardize the meaning of words like socialism to further obfuscate the root of the society in decline. In contrast, a populist right emerges, featuring huge swaths of disenfranchised working class people, who know firsthand the decrepit shell of an economy that imperialism has brought on, but through decades of anti-communism, red bashing and anti-union sentiment, have been foreclosed on the language needed to give expression to their material reality. This energy needing to be released, has been commandeered by the emergence of fake right-wing populists, who maintain anti-establishment optics, who express skepticism to bankers and elites, but who beguile their masses and manifest this energy to scapegoat and to further sharpen this founding contradiction, all while supporting the very thing they curse in their speeches, finance capital. This is an inquiry into the nature and consequences of finance capital and financialization, because to understand today is to understand finance capital. Leaving aside questions of why, finance capital is a form of capital unique only to the monopoly stage of capitalism. Finance capital is characterized by the merging of industrial and bank capital, headed by bank capital. Quote unquote merging here is not meant in a mechanical legal sense, but in an effective sense. The division of labor between the industrial and banking dimensions of enterprise management are still maintained, but bank capital increasingly involves itself with the day-to-day -day operation of its biggest clients. Finance capital is unique insofar as it is the purest expression of capital, and from its own perspective, the general circuit of finance capital is uniquely MM prime, compared to the operating circuit of all other forms of capital, MCM prime. All other non-financial forms of capital are forced, not out of their goodwill, but out of an economic necessity to generate some sort of commodity, some sort of use value in their quest to reproduce themselves, a principle entirely missing from finance capital. It could be argued that in the age of competition, the bank would provide the service of actively connecting credit demand with credit supply, and that productive capital would use its dominant position to force bank capital into renouncing its natural fictitiousness, but we have long surpassed that epoch. Now it is the lender that goes to the bank, not the other way around, while the absolutism of finance remains unchallenged. This lack of the necessity for a commodity in its completed circuit makes it possible for finance capital to appropriate value without producing value. This is a fact even modern bourgeois economists are painfully forced to acknowledge, or it is otherwise nakedly exposed in no income, no jobs, no assets, or ninja loans. As a note, some would say the banking question is providing the service of risk, but this is a function all providers of capital fulfill. It is nothing special to finance capital. There is no assurance of success for any capital provider. It is a function hidden within the category of M itself. Now, returning where we left off, finance capital is the least socially and materially productive type of capital. It is especially reactionary. As such, just like imperialism, finance capital, in dialectical terms, represents a secondary contradiction, an extra tumor that compounds onto the primary one, in this and only in this special stage of capitalism, calling to rally against it a much broader social base and warranting special hatred from revolutionaries. Against finance capital stands not only the proletariat, not only the peasantry, but also the petty bourgeoisie and large swaths of the non-financial bourgeoisie of all sizes, the small, the medium, and even some of the big non-financial bourgeoisie. If we truly wish to provide a proper and full analysis of finance capital, we could not do without covering the role of finance capital in the rise of the global financial division of labor, which puts finance at one end, the imperial core, and production at the other, the periphery. This process of outsourcing real production out of the imperial core and concentrating finance within intimately shaped and stratified the class composition of the imperial core from the 80s till today, and thus all the preceding revolutionary politics. As the total mass of finance capital exponentially grew from cycle to cycle, 
so did the corresponding managerial needs of finance capital, and also the percentage of the labor force needed to be devoted to the managing of finance capital. Of course, this new order of things could not have fallen from the sky. It had to be molded out of the then current. Manufacturing jobs had to be replaced within the country with financial managerial jobs. Thus two birds were hit with one stone in the outsourcing process. Finance capital completed its mission and grew its profits. Those who resisted the shift, or were unable to adapt, were incentivized. They were economically and culturally coerced. They were systematically denied employment. They were denied benefits, they were bullied, and they were spat on. They were made examples of. The economic aspects of this said incentivization are obvious, but in light of the despicable attitudes certain quote-unquote leftists have presented, it is important to face the changes in civil society as well, society's prevailing ideology. There has always been a general disdain for the working man, but this has remained and evolved, expanded. There is now a special disgust for the uneducated, and as finance capital continues to stratify the working class, even part of the workers themselves relish in this contempt. They are lazy, they are bigoted, they are stupid, they are the chav, the terrone, literally meaning he who works the land, or the hillbilly. They are no longer addressed as the working class, but as the only inglorious bastards truly deserving of their condition. Those disposed of by the system, coming from all social strata, manufacturing workers who lost their jobs, small enterprise radically outcompeted, business owners who lost their partners, they became lumpenized, they became disposed, they became the lumpen proletariat. The lumpen proletariat is most principally defined by its non-relation to production. It is as such, by definition, not a class, as classes acquire meaning only insofar as they have a definite relation to production. To end our analysis here, however, would be a mistake of utmost one-sidedness, and a failure to properly analyze the purpose of the lumpen proletariat. The lumpen has no direct hand in the immediate production process, but it lays at the heart of the extended reproduction of capital. Just as the reserve army of labor is the message to the workers to calmly accept their subjugation, lumpenization is the same principle applied to encompass more than one class. Let us demonstrate this principle taking the example of the petty bourgeoisie disposed in the transition from competitive to monopoly capitalism. When, after a period of capitalism's initial development, lumpenization affects the petty bourgeois classes too now, it is making an example out of those who oppose the development of capital. Those who for one specific form of capital were in full unanimous support, but now do not want to bring the movement to its logical conclusion. Those who now turn their backs towards the current capital's path in favor for longing for a past that completely contradicts the current character of capital. The lumpen proletariat is that kin that has faced capital's raised hand. It is the resolute threat against all those that oppose capital's tyranny in all its forms and all its development. Lumpenization is the most primitive requirement for the upholding of the dictatorship of capital. But through this example, it becomes clear that lumpenization transcends any one specific mode of production, and is not only at the heart of the extended reproduction of capital, but the founding principle for the extended reproduction of all relations of production. Having overcome its own disorganization, defeating any vestiges of working class power left, and unshackling itself of the dependence on more complex labor through automation, neoliberalism unleashed the complete violence of the dictatorship of capital, and reduced the remaining proletariat to merely semi-lumpen precariat. Even the working class's own existence as working was now uncertain, precarious even. Temporary expulsion from the productive process was to be expected, and a dive into the lumpen life became a regularity. Monopoly capital had succeeded. The taste of the lumpen life, of its despair, its depravity, and its suffering, had imprinted an image so vivid that those same vocal voices of old shut their mouths, and the flame of resistance faded. At the same time, 
it appeared then that those few remaining in security were only the privileged, so that the salariat now more and more completely coincided with the labor aristocracy. Such was the only coherent conclusion of monopoly. Returning to the question of the Lumpen's quote-unquote class interest, the Lumpen proletariat does not, or cannot, possess what will be similarly called a homogeneous class interest, because it is not a class as much as it is a social strata, absorbing many different X-classes. It does, however, hold certain common points that span across divisions within the Lumpen proletariat, a basic program, a crude common economic interest. It is the logic of capital that created and keeps the lumpen in its obligatory misery, so that all sections of the lumpen proletariat are joined in their struggle against the unchallenged logic of capital, but not all sections are so confident in their devotion as to come against the basic essence of capital itself. This said, all of the lumpen proletariat wants to shed its idleness and rejoin the productive process. We have that when the proletarian lumpen proletariat achieves its only discernible immediate goal, the end of its non-relation to production, it instantly steps into the line of work, so that the natural conclusion of these events is that in the pursuit of its own interest, the lumpen proletariat at once assumes the same interests of the working class we know so well, and at once joins the working class in its struggle. As we have seen, there is great revolutionary potential inherent to the lumpen. Examples like the Black Panther Party do nothing but confirm this. But there is an energy of vitriol, frustration, and most importantly, desperation that can be mobilized and has historically been mobilized by the counter-revolution. The experience of the June days, the Weimar Republic and fascist Italy come quickly to mind. The lumpen is in a liminal space of sorts. When out of work, it is deprived of the right to work for capital's reserve army of labor project. And when in work, suffers the same general oppression the proletariat faces daily. But at the same time, the intense desperation of the lumpen makes it most susceptible to prioritizing its immediate existence as opposed to long-term existence. And therefore, it is also more likely to join the ranks of the bourgeois counter-revolution for a quick buck. Thus Marx and Engels, when writing of the lumpen as a bribed tool of reactionary intrigue, were indeed correct. But such behavior increasingly represents only a fraction of the lumpen. The proletariat was termed, quote, alone a really revolutionary class, end quote, in the manifesto, the first mass-based class that could organize in pursuit of its revolutionary demands. Owing to the vast array of social relations the proletariat establishes simply through its mere existence as the proletariat, as the first toiling class to engage in collective and not individual labor, and the first toiling class to survive on an exchange and not a subsistence basis. With this in mind, it all becomes clear. The lumpen proletariat, revolutionary in its aim, but betrayed by its very essence of existence, its defining as lack thereof those very characteristics that made the proletariat an effective revolutionary class in the first place, is doomed to remain astray in its revolutionary crusade compared to its more amazing cousin, the proletariat. Impotent to properly and fully construct its own vanguard party, armed with its own fully refined theory, the lumpen is blindfolded and decrepit as a revolutionary force when viewed next to the proletariat. The lumpen is designed not to take leadership in society on its own accord, but to try and expropriate what it wants from what it is already given, accepting that which it loosely understands as intersecting with its interests or rejecting politics altogether. Unable to propose its own unique answers, it turns to those already given for a potential already present substitute, to give them a try. And seeing the bourgeoisification of the left, together with the general anti-establishment aesthetic 
in particular anti-left aesthetic the right wears, the lumpen relapses into the crude logic of the enemy of my enemy that looks like my friend is indeed my friend, and cheers the names Trump, Hoffer, Salvini and Le Pen. This is the paradox of the modern situation. Those who possess the truest, the most acute radicalism find no way to properly express it. It should be obvious to state that it has been finance capital that has benefited most from the Lumpen's mandatory ignorance, in a sense transcending more than classical loan tomfoolery, advantaging itself of the Lumpen's weak-eyed ear to throw on cheap disguises and adjust its flute to the sound sweet to the lumpen so that they may be attracted to follow, but in all reality continuing to lead them to the jaws of the beast directly. And yet, out of the mist of change has arisen another victor, the clown who wants to be king. Why does the clown who wants to be king without any royal blood focus his campaign on winning the support of the lumpen? Because if he drew strength alone from the one or the other sect of the non-dominant bourgeoisie, whether petty or small or middle, even a section of the dominant bourgeoisie, or altogether, he could not but end his battle in defeat. For was it not the weakness of those classes that removed them from power in the first place? And clearly the organized proletariat will not be mocked by his buffoonery. So who has he left to turn to? None other than the lumpen, the marginalized, the disposed. He preys on the ignorance of the lumpen and plays fully into their weaknesses. Whether Bonaparte or Berlusconi, riding on their backs to topple the current king and bring him to his future throne. The clown king does not break the royal system or even overthrow the current nobility, but simply exchanges the current king's highest little circle for his own, without as much as grazing the bulk of the last king's nobility. He is employed by a subdivision of the ruling bourgeois caste against another subdivision of the ruling bourgeois caste. He is nothing more and nothing less. The lumpen is continually thrown left and right, betrayed, abused and discarded by all the clown kings that come along, and yet even if stepping on them once does not awaken them, even if stepping on them twice does not awaken them, step on them three times and you will not be certain. The lines by which demagogues take advantage of the lumpen's position vary considerably from culture to culture. While the likes of Berlusconi make explicit role of gangster bureaucrats, a Trump leans into a more general expression of anti-establishment, anti-globalization sentiment, together with the nostalgia for American protectionism and the return to the Jeffersonian free market of small business. The likes of Farage's movement were along a similar line, pointing to the EU and the European Central Bank as responsible for the decline of the British real productive forces. As Gramsci spoke to civil society as being the defining reason for which the revolution failed to find footing in the West, we can suggest why within the imperial core of the modern day, the lumpen has a tendency to be swayed towards a reactionary stance. The war of position is more easily won by finance capitalists and petty bourgeoisie in the case of the lumpen proletariat than in the case of the proletariat. Finance capital and petty bourgeois elements hold more kernels of hegemonic power and the narrative, control over media outlets, universities, movies, etc. from inception. But the quality and scale each respective group, proletariat and lumpen proletariat, presents in their responsive counter-hegemony is vastly different, vastly inferior for the lumpen for reasons already outlined. That is the root cause of finance capital's or unparalleled domination in the lumpen war of position. As an exercise, let us go over the different sections of the American lumpen. Lumpen are a product of accumulation cycles that bring them into existence as a surplus population. They are defined by their non-relation to production. Among the lumpen, there is the honest lumpen, the lumpen with one foot in labor. They are the ones that demonstrate the most potential for revolutionary organization and they are the least likely to join the bourgeois counter-revolution. They can be coalesced with the proletariat, but there are major hurdles. They do pose a small confused threat to proletarian political goals because their immediate interests are not defined to labor ends, and their inability to organize as both a vanguard and a class sometimes makes it difficult for the individual lumpen to understand his long-term interests. Instead, they are far more vulnerable to constrain politics with identity politics. And then there is also that neoliberalization of precarity work has left most honest lumpen reduced to needy opportunists. 
Examples of the honest lumpen are contingent laborers, service workers, structurally unemployed, retirees, etc. Aside from the honest lumpen, there's also the nostalgic lumpen, having a particular relationship to the past. They are generally divided into two sections, petty bourgeois nostalgic lumpen and proletarian nostalgic lumpen. This combination is where we get the synergy manifested in Trumpism. Characterizing petty bourgeois nostalgic lumpen, the key points are petty bourgeois nostalgia for the Jeffersonian type of concept. They are previously successful small businessmen that are not exposed. They are in the reactionary camp and related to banonism, and they are disposed, but not as disposed as the white working class. In contrast, the most important points for the proletarian nostalgic lumpen are they have no connection to labor, completely unemployed, and thus have a greater proclivity for forming a subservient parasitic relationship with finance capital. Much of them come from the previous industrial proletariat, hard hat coalition. They are also nostalgic for the past, but not in a petty bourgeois way. They are interested in how there was plenty of work, we were treated well, that life was great. They do not care for the petty bourgeois line of, quote, business was booming, and they are also related to banonism. The change in class politics but also with it a parallel change in mainstream bourgeois politics. As new fronts opened and old ones closed, a new environment emerged, a rupture from the old society. The increase in the scale of production enabled by the information age, the expansion and diversification of operations, the appearance of mega corporations, all of this fundamentally changed the playing field. Where before the professional managerial class, here are now referred to only as PMC, the middle capitalist, the labor aristocrat, so directly to the right of its master. The final completion of the socialization of production that was the information age turned this all on its head, producing such a situation whereby power flew through many intertwined and branching channels instead of a singular discernible linear flow. Everyone was subservient to someone else. Previously, there had only been one boss and only one manager, while now one can speak only of layers upon layers of corporate bureaucracy, buried in mysticism and intrigue. All resemblance of clarity on power had been removed, and the frame of boss versus employee, the heart of all previous proletarian analysis, completely collapsed as the financial elite rejoiced at the chaos under the sky, finding itself excellently able to move among the confusion. The new PMC held all the appearance of labor, but none of the content, legally owning no property, but still being on the side of the proprietors. It worked to live, but did not oppose exploitation. It joined the union, but hated the unionized. The PMC exploited its surface appearance to infiltrate the proletarian movement, a historically leftist one, and attack from within. Using the esteemed positions it gained to gently whisper devilish malice into the air of the proletariat, wrapping the agenda of the enemies of the working class within a thin veil of pseudo-leftist rhetoric, that when ripped off, reveals nothing but a program of reaction. In this way, the old working class institutions became those of the bourgeoisie, and labor became Blair's new labor, while democracy became Clintonist new democrats. The bourgeoisie found itself obviously a favorable situation in the new movement, attaching itself to the PMC, its program and its government, but sections of the traditional right bourgeoisie ironically took advantage of the new situation as well, simply in the opposite direction. They developed a new political strategy, positioning themselves as opposition to the pseudo bourgeoisified left establishment but not as opposition to the fundamental bourgeois order. They would reap all, but sow nothing. So while it was once the left that advocated basic social protection for workers, while the right screamed foul, it is now the right that speaks of supporting families, and the left that most blatantly apologizes for corporate tyranny. Even if in effect these words are empty, the mockery of one is to the face, while the mockery of the other is behind closed doors. The Salvinis, the Trumps, and the O2s talk of worker representation, unemployment from deindustrialization, and protecting farmers, while the Vorsches, the Destinies, and the Renzis defend corporate censorship, trust the FBI for, quote, some things, and oversee austerity. As the social composition of class forces have changed, so has their interplay, the alliances, struggles, and coalitions between them. You may ask why this would be of interest to a proletarian revolutionary. After all, the proletariat has no allies, but in the present age, where finance capital has disposed of more than a single class, a temporary multi-class coalition is not only favorable, but necessary for the proletarian victory. Let us quote from the programs of the Marxist-Leninist parties of today. 
the program of the Communist Party of Portugal states, the growing foreign domination over Portugal's economy, and the subjugation of Portuguese interests to foreign interests within a framework of monopoly restoration and capitalist European integration have created conditions to extend even further the social and party political alliances for specific goals, even if merely in the short term. The system of alliances determines PCP policy towards working class unity and unity among all working people, towards unity or convergence between anti-monopoly classes and social movements, towards unity or convergence in action between democratic and patriotic forces. The program of the Communist Party of Greece states, For that reason, KKE today call for the people not only to resist the new anti-people, anti-worker attack of capital by the government of Syriza Anno, but to make the struggles of the next period the start of the regrouping of the workers' movement, the strengthening of the People's Alliance, to make clear the anti-capitalist, anti-monopolistic direction of the movement, concentrating on the real enemy, the monopolies, capital, the bourgeoisie and their governments, their parties, their external allies, EU, USA, NATO. This is the only way so that the balance of power can change for the benefit of the people, so that the people can organize into one powerful determined force, that today can put obstacles to the anti-people attack and tomorrow overthrow it, the capitalist state, and enforce its own way out from the memorandums and capitalist development. In that process, the workers can have small or big successes and wins, and in the ballot box, they must stand with that criterion on how their votes can help, how it can aid the struggle to change the balance of forces so that the people can rise up, organized and determined to take their fate into their own hands. The program of the Communist Party of India Marxist states 6.2 The Communist Party of India Marxist firmly adheres to its aim of building socialism and communism. This, it is evident, cannot be achieved under the present state and bourgeois landlord government led by the big bourgeoisie. The establishment of a genuine social society is only possible under proletarian statehood. While adhering to the aim of building socialism in our country, the Communist Party of India Marxist, taking into consideration the degree of economic development, the political ideological maturity of the working class and its organization places before the people as the immediate objective the establishment of people's democracy based on the coalition of all genuine anti-feudal, anti-monopoly and anti-imperialist forces led by the working class on the basis of a firm worker-peasant alliance. This demands first and foremost the replacement of the present bourgeois landlord state by a state of people's democracy. This alone can complete the unfinished democratic task of the Indian Revolution and pave the way for putting the country on the road to socialism. The Program of the Party of Labour of Austria states, Article 25. It is the task of the PDA to be capable of forming an alliance. It must not isolate itself in a sectarian way or behave in a know-it-all and disciplining manner towards others. It is therefore ready to work with all socialist, communist, revolutionary and left, but also democratic, socially progressive, pacifist and anti-fascist forces, if it results from a concrete agreement, without reservations due to other differences of opinion. The PDA has to prove to be a reliable ally, who stands by his word and whose handshake applies. In general, it is about the creation of a dynamic anti-monopoly alliance for democracy, social progress, national independence and peace, which also encompasses social classes such as small farmers and tradespeople, freelancers and intellectuals which are objectively just as opposed to imperialism and monopoly capital. Such a society of revolutionary anti-monopoly democracy would not be turning back the wheel of history, because the power of the monopolies would not be shattered by reverting the concentration of production, but through a step towards state capitalism, a step towards state capitalist monopoly which is made to serve the whole people, a step towards socialism. The quote-unquote revolutionary or anti-establishment movements of today all expand their horizons further than just the narrow limitations of their own particular class. They have all come to the painful realization that their strength alone won't suffice to cut down the mighty Goliath. The revolutionary classes of today, the lumpen proletariat, the precariat and what is left of the proletariat, the petty bourgeoisie and the non-monopoly bourgeoisie, have come together and brought on an era of quote-unquote populist politics that transcends further than any general left-right division. Yet, it is essential to recognize the left-right division within populist politics. Left-wing populism is the multi-class coalition led by the more proletarian precarian lumpen elements. It possesses partial or full-class consciousness, while right-wing populism is the same coalition led by the petty bourgeoisie or non-monopoly bourgeois elements. 
left populism has actively achieved proletarian consciousness or is on the eve of achieving it, while right populism knowingly involves itself in the business of obstructing the growth of proletarian class consciousness by inserting its own carefully devised false consciousness. Constant machinations over immigrants focusing on a clique instead of a class, conspiracies, etc. That said, even a right populist movement can nonetheless be somewhat progressive. Some have despaired at the lack of any clear schism, but this is what maturation means. That today is sprinkled with the hints of tomorrow, but is not quite yet tomorrow. Revolutionary prospects, admittedly small, but growing, have propped up all across Western Europe and the US. They must not be ignored. In terms of left populism, the US had the two Bernie campaigns. While Europe had Podemos in Spain, Syriza in Greece, the Linke in Germany, and some would say the Five Star Movement in Italy. All of these causes have taken considerable setbacks, but their significance remains unchanged. The Lumpen has shown a number of little potential signs of organizing itself, forming Casa Pound in Italy, but such organizations have now almost been eradicated, and the few that do exist, e.g. Casa Pound, are only in the infancy of gaining class consciousness. The experience of right populism is a much more complicated and convoluted issue. Many clowns who want to be king and bourgeois groups have disguised themselves as right populist. So many that only AFD in Germany remains as a real right populist party. Some would contest and deem AFD another bundle of lies and false promises akin to Lega and the Five Star Movement. But such logic is incomplete. Both parties were bought at the last minute. But after having done this twice, the EU is simply too low on funds to do it another time. Alternative for Deutschland is a populist movement led by the petty bourgeoisie and non-monopoly bourgeoisie. It is funded by the non-monopoly bourgeoisie, receiving its most notable donation from a shareholder of SMS Group, a company boasting 14,000 employees. For comparison, Bosch receives 400,000, and receiving a largest donation between 2014 to 2018 of 200,000 euros, while in the same time frame, the CDU received a maximum donation of 1.4 million euros. All of this is represented in the party's program, the utmost expression of its class position. The program starts off strong. In the democracy and core values section, demonstrating a clear anti-banker, anti-elite position, positing that Germany's misguided development has been engineered by, and to the benefit of, a small political elite. This is clearly not class consciousness, but these are the baby steps needed to get there. The AFD rejects what it calls the collectivization of European liability risk and the fact that Germany pays assistance to other countries having economic trouble. This is a very important point as EU imperialism is reliant on repaying national debts through assistance. It wants the imperialized states to be semi-starved but not die. It does not want their economy to collapse completely. Thus occasionally helping pay off some debt is a short-term loss but a necessity for EU imperialism. As the non-monopoly bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie do not benefit from EU imperialism, they reject this short-term loss, because there is no accompanying long-term gain for them. The AFD supports reform of the UN that promote true multipolarity, and dislikes the policy of intervening in other states' affairs. The non-monopoly and petty bourgeoisie do not only not benefit from EU imperialism, but do not benefit from imperialism in general. In fact, they are hurt by imperialism, and the opportunities they lose. At the same time, AFD also rejects aggressive NATO, aka imperialist NATO, but it does not reject NATO in general, because AFD is still some form of bourgeois, and as Lenin said, the unity of Europe is the unity of suppressing socialism and competing with other capitalist blocs. Here we see a confirmation of the above point. AFD, in contrast to imperialists, seeks to help countries overcome their dependency, instead of fostering it. AFD supports retaining minimum wages on the basis that they quote, adjust the remunerative position of low-income workers as weak market players with respect to the interests of employers as strong market players, and also safeguard low-income workers against wage pressure caused by recent mass immigration. As we stated before, AFD is a populist movement led by the non-monopoly bourgeoisie slash petty bourgeoisie. And because maintaining its Lumpen support base is vital to it not being crushed instantly by the monopolies, it must also take the interests of the Lumpen into account to some degree. The AFD is against needless bureaucracy. 
This is only natural as the petty bourgeoisie and non-monopoly bourgeoisie are obviously against bureaucrat capitalism. The AFD is against what it calls the financial discrimination against families. This is another example of the AFD having to keep in mind the Lumpen's interest. The AFD supports the traditional family because the Lumpen resists that neoliberal model of social relations which seeks to atomize the individual by encouraging meaningless relationships while discouraging meaningful ones, like building a family, and destroy the family because familiar relations are the basis of many further social relations. Once again, the leading non-monopoly bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie are dragged along. The AFD is against the rejection of motherhood and the sexualization of children. The productive capital the non-monopoly bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie represent is against both finance capital's normalization of pedophilia in the form of earlier and earlier sexualization of teens and neoliberal feminism's attitude to women, which rejects their role in the reproduction of society in favor of joining the sex industry. Both of these things, pedophilia and the rejection of motherhood, are detrimental to the reproduction of the labor force. But because finance capital does not produce a commodity, and this requires only unproductive labor, it can replace the workforce entirely with machinery. A very gnarly fact seeing that an immense treasury was found in the sex and pedophile industry. The AFD desires to quote, curtail lobbyism. This is an obvious fight against the power of monopolies, which we should expect knowing that the AFD is led by the petty bourgeoisie and non-monopoly bourgeoisie, two classes that are inherently against monopoly. The AFD takes the obvious philosophical position of the petty bourgeoisie and non-monopoly bourgeoisie, stating that free competition is the underpinning to their prosperity, and rejecting that laughable caricature of the free market where it's free competition only until special interest groups are at risk. The AFD states it is for social market economy over the current state of affairs, which they call state-directed economy. Aside from the weak calls to the economic calculation problem, this is a position fundamentally against the current system of state-enforced monopoly capitalism, where the state, in bed with the monopolies, protects them through government intervention. The AFD seeks to reduce and limit unwarranted state subsidies, which is in reality going against state-enforced monopoly capitalism, because subsidies have been an important tool for state-enforced monopoly capitalism. For example, since 2008, 1.5 trillion euros of taxpayer money have been used to bail out failing banks in Europe. The AFD seeks to reduce bureaucracy, which is another example of them going against both bureaucrat capitalism and state-enforced monopoly capitalism. The AFD promises no privatization without citizen approval. This is another question of maintaining the lumpen support. The AFD also rejects politicized sanctions because politicized sanctions are tools of imperialism and for reasons already explained, the non-monopoly bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie are against imperialism. At the same time, the AFD is for increasing national control over trade agreements while also rejecting a number of already existing trade agreements. The non-monopoly bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie are against the completely free movement of capital because they do not represent what is globally most profitable. Free movement of capital would result only in capital moving away from the monopoly bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie. The AFD once more comes against state-enforced monopoly capitalism, explicitly stating that it is against over-regulation which disproportionately affects small and medium companies more than large corporations. The AFD is for strengthening consumer protection, improving food labeling, reducing planned obsolescence, increasing safety measures for children's toys, and improving water treatment. This is a position of twofold importance. At once, it is an anti-monopoly stance, natural for the non-monopoly bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie. After all, their enterprises are consumers of monopolies as well but it is also again a position to gain the lumpen support. The AFD seeks a number of reforms to the German tax system, including abolishing wealth and inherent tax. This must again be understood in the context of the fight against state monopoly capitalism, especially since they explicitly state that the German tax system disproportionately affects small and medium enterprises more than large corporations. In actuality, 
the German tax system does not effectively redistribute wealth. The AFD's agricultural policy consists of less subsidies, a blow against state enforced monopoly capitalism, and opposing land speculation. Nothing surprising coming from representatives of productive capital. This brings us to the conclusion of our exercise in analyzing the AFD's program and party characteristics. By now, we should have almost definitively proven that our analysis of the AFD as a populist movement led by the petty bourgeoisie and non-monopoly bourgeoisie is correct. We certainly have come a long way since 1917. There is no longer any Bolshevik party nor the immediate prospect of revolution. But what has not changed is that Marxism remains not a universal value, but a universal truth. The leaders of the left ignored Lenin's profound wisdom that we must work in the reactionary trade unions, and took up a spineless line of conflating reactionary tendencies with reaction itself, either because they were afraid of the work that had to be done, or, more insidiously, because they were afraid of where that work would lead abandoning the same brothers and sisters they swore to die by. They neglected properly analyzing the situation within the imperial core on the basis that it was all proto-fascism, and they neglected the painful cries of the exploited on the basis that they were the true exploiters. And now we are facing the consequences. The potential revolutionaries of tomorrow, the proletarian lumpen, have all swarmed to the right petty bourgeoisie and away from us. It cannot be ignored that especially recently, it seems to become clear and clear that those same gentlemen championing tactics which inexplicably lead the left to failure appear to be bourgeois agents, saboteurs and opportunists. The PMC has infiltrated the movement exploiting its appearance. We are now facing our very own Mensheviks, our very own two-line struggle. If anything is to be taken from all of this, do not be afraid to engage with reactionaries, and do not be afraid of right-wing workers. That is what the enemy wants.